Hello and welcome to the Addicts Anonymous podcast. I'm your host, Jamar. Today's episode 189, and we're going to be interviewing Jared. How are you doing today, Jared? Doing well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. You were able to make sure you got it and all that great stuff? Yes, sir. All right, good. So I just want to make sure. Um, so let's get started. Tell me about your childhood and growing up. Well, um, so I'm from Muncie, Indiana. I was born here in Muncie, uh, raised in Muncie, live in Muncie now. And I was born in 1980, so it was the decade of decadence. Um, my parents were both hardworking people, but um, they were also they were also users. Um, when I was younger, I didn't know it at the time, but they were they were using hard drugs what, and what kind uh, of drugs, cocaine mostly. Um, I did know they smoked pot and drank, you know, I grew up, I grew up, that was normal. And, um, they did it in front of you, the pot. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They did it in front of us. And I even remember in uh, kindergarten. So my school did call my dad because, uh, back then we had the, the dare program and yeah, we had, I, I was born in 82, so not far off. Yeah. Right. So they had a an officer come into our class and talk to us about drugs. And of course they talked to him about marijuana. And then they asked, um, you know, they told us a little bit about, about it and, uh, asked if we knew anybody that smoked marijuana. And so <laughs> I raised my hand up. I was like, yeah, my dad smokes pot. You oh, know, no. smokes pot. <laughs> so, but that was also back in the days where, you know, school just basically called to tell my dad and, uh, yeah, I don't know what he said, but it was, you know, it wasn't a big deal. Um, but we grew up middle class, upper middle class, I guess, at the time. Um, my dad worked for a uh, Borg Warner here in town, which was a Borg Warner, which large that? manufacturer, uh, okay. the Ford manufacturer. So here in Muncie, we had uh, Ford manufacturer and we had uh, a chevy plant too so we were a booming industrial uh, town and um you know it paid well they were union so i mean we grew up we never wanted for anything so in that respect you know my childhood was good i don't really remember my parents fighting too much um but there was obviously troubles. And uh, when I was 11, they got divorced. And um, once once they got divorced, it was just uh, life just changed. You know, I always did real well in school. I continue to do real well in school. But my dad was a disciplinarian and my mom was not. And she kind of let us do whatever we wanted to do which was to our detriment um looking back on it now that was not what we needed and uh um, what kind of stuff would you be doing well as i got older i started drinking i started drinking about 14 years old that's when i started getting into pot um but my mom drank a lot and she was oftentimes at the bar and um so she left us kids home quite a bit. So not only was I able to drink a lot, but it became the place to hang out for my friends too. It was a place they could come after school, they could drink and they could, uh, we could smoke pot, we could party and um, didn't have to worry about getting in trouble. And actually, so what, what would happen if your parents walked in on that? You know, we, uh, I got busted one time before my mom, she, uh, she was supposed to be gone all night. So we, man, we were, we were, uh, partying. We lived upstairs or I, I had an upstairs bedroom and I remember coming down to get a beer out of the fridge and I had the doors locked and I heard something. I looked over and there's my mom trying to get in the door and, uh, 
I just shut the lights off and ran back upstairs. <laughs> and she had to crawl through a window. She was so mad. But, um, but you know, nothing really happened. She made everybody leave. And the crazy part is they were drunk, you know. She, she made everybody drive home. Um, and then that was it. I mean, she, she yelled. And that was it. And uh, I just didn't get in trouble. And then actually after that incident, you know, we had a talk and mom said, uh, basically, I know you guys are going to be partying. And she felt bad about sending these guys home. So it became a safe space. So she said, you can party here, you know, as long as you guys party here. And if anybody's drunk, they spend the night. And so, so really about 15, 16 years old, we got permission to, to do whatever. And uh, as long as we stayed upstairs, it was kind of out of sight, out of mind, you know. And it's um, dangerous because that's the time when your brain is uh, still really forming and you're coming to, you know, who you are and all that stuff. So it can really, really damage your um, maturity and stuff like that. And damage your your growth mentally. Yeah, no, it. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. I started smoking pot young as well, but my dad would have killed me. You know, my dad would have done the same thing too. And so, also at that time period, I uh, I didn't want to go to my dad, so I kind of stopped going so much, and my mom allowed that, and uh, it was just because my dad. My dad just would not, he was not going to allow that stuff. So, you know, through the last part of high school, I, uh, do you, I real have, quick, quick question. Would you do that with your children? No, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. No. Yeah. No, no, question. no, it was, a. Uh, it wasn't good for us at all, you know, and then I had a, my little sister. She's three years younger than me that grew up there as well. So she started that stuff even younger. And really? uh, yeah, and I let her I let her party with us sometimes, you know, um, I think I got her high when she was 11 years old. And so that started her down a wrong path, you know, so. She also has addiction issues. Yes. Yes, she does. But that's uh, that's pretty much my childhood. That's how I I grew up. Um, you know, from about the time I was fourteen on, I uh, just kind of party every weekend. You know, it started to be we smoked pot every day. Um, we did go to school high. Oh yeah. Yeah, and um, we got into LSD, and we got into pills. We got got into all that stuff. And what age did you get into the pills and LSD? About fifteen years old. Wow, that's really young. Yeah, yeah, and actually, I uh, so when I was fifteen, I wasn't quite sixteen yet. I uh, I had a fifth of vodka, and I put it in one of those big sports cups, right? Mm -hmm. and mix some pop in with it which was terrible but um but i drank about half a fifth before school and at the time our school would let you carry these sports cups around and um by the time so i carried it around to all the classes and by the time um lunch rolled around i had drank the whole fifth and i remember going out I, I had a friend, I knew his car was unlocked, and um, anyways, I, I had access to his key, so I went out there to smoke a cigarette, and uh, as I'm smoking, I, th I, I thought to myself, man, you know, nice day to go for a drive, and so there's this country road right by our school, so I'm 15 years old, I take this guy's car, and go down this country road, and uh, man, I never made it back. They said I was going down, I was going about 75 miles an hour, <clears throat> and uh, 
I missed a turn. It was a curvy country road. And I flipped this car three times. Oh, and wow. it was about 500 feet off the road. And, um, were you hurt? Yeah, I was, I was hurt. I was in the hospital about six days, I think five or six days. And I busted, I luckily it wasn't as bad as it could have been, but, um, you know, I had punctured my lungs. I punctured my spleen. I busted an eye orbital. Um, they had to put a metal plate in my skull. And when I woke up in the hospital, my dad was holding my hand and he, and he, and he was crying. And, uh, I just remember that. And then, then my dad got saved and my dad quit. He quit doing drugs and he quit at the time he was just smoking pot and drinking but he quit all that and uh yeah i think it's funny how us addicts think that we're just smoking pot and just drinking that we're okay right yeah yeah the, the things our own brains will tell us you know what i mean oh yeah yeah and i remember my dad telling me when we were talking about this, that he felt convicted to quit drinking, you know, so he quit drinking and, uh, he said within two weeks, he put the pot down too. Cause he said, man, it's, it's all the same thing, you know? Yeah. Well, in, in a way, I mean, the only difference is if you overdo alcohol, you get really drunk and you do, possibly some stupid shit or some dangerous stuff. Um, with marijuana, you just fall asleep if you do too much. Right. That's the main difference. Like marijuana, there's no like super and like super high because you smoke so much that you go do something stupid. Yeah. I think that's yep. the benefit of marijuana. I agree. I agree. So with everything going on, how did you do in school? And I did really good in school. Um, I did so well, in fact, that my my last year of school, my senior year, I figured that I could fail all my classes. If I just passed one each semester, I would still graduate and get the... Uh, the uh, Indiana honor roll. So, so that's what I did. I, How uh, would you be on the honor roll? Well, the um, you graduate with honor. So, to get the uh, Indiana it's the Indiana Academic Honor Diploma, right? And you had to have a certain GPA. And I forget exactly what that GPA is now, but um, I think it's like a, a B or something like that. But it's the Indiana Academic Honors Diploma. So my grades were so high, you know, and I was able to I just messed around my last year. And actually, I almost got kicked out of school for missing so much school, but but I made it, I made the bare minimum, you know, I graduated with the academic honors diploma and uh, thought that was a big joke back, back then that man, you know, I didn't even hardly go to school, didn't do any work and still got this. Yeah. And I feel like you beat the system. Felt like I beat the system, you know, but uh, it was really making life more difficult. It was teaching me a lot of negative things, you know, not only was I getting more involved with the drugs, but I was getting lazy, you know. What, what kind of things would you have insight into? As far as? As um, as far as just stuff that that experience, that you, as of now, the experiences would tell you. Well, I saw, I saw people that partied with me 
that continued to to do both go to school and, and still party maybe not as hard as as me you know but um i just saw them be more successful as I got out of school you know i i became i really did become lazy about things i mean it got to the point where you know i i really did just want to party all the time and i really it was hard for me to uh it was hard for me to focus and, and do reports. It was hard for me to really, I don't know, get get involved with school, you know, just doing the bare minimum to uh, to pass. So, yeah, I mean, if I had it, you know, knowing what I know now, I would have stayed the course because I think that also um, builds a, a better work ethic. You know, I did go on to college and I went for two years at Ball State University. And uh, during those two years, I had a 3.9 GPA. But what was you your know, major? I, uh, natural resources and environmental management. Oh, very interesting. What made you decide that? Well, also, when I was younger, I just always loved outdoors. You know, we uh, my dad took us every weekend to uh, Lake Webster. We had a place up in uh, North Webster, Indiana on the lake. And so we were up there all through the summer, every weekend. So I love the outdoors um, with my grandpa on my mom's side. I hunted a lot, you know, so I liked the woods. I enjoyed all that. I enjoyed fishing. And so, um, so I thought, you know, a career like maybe a DNR agent, or something like that is uh, is what I wanted to pursue. That's really cool. Yeah. Yep. So you did really well in college. Why did you only go for two years? So once I graduated high school, I I got real. I did get real focused on college, and I thought, man, this is this is my opportunity to stop all this nonsense. And, um, you know, everything was pretty much paid for uh, through grants um, and scholarships for my school. So I thought this was just a, a great opportunity um, in my life. And so I didn't I didn't hardly I cut down a lot on the partying. I mean, I still every once in a while party, but really probably less than most most people that go to college and party. I mean, I cut it way down. And that really reflected in my grades, you know, and um, I worked all through that time and, and I held down the job and um, I just I did well. And then what happened was I started to uh, after two years, I started to get back into drinking every day again. And uh, then I got involved with a girl and uh, she got you, pregnant you, you were drinking every day what was your drink of choice you know I drank uh drank a lot of natty light I drank a lot of beer back okay then. Well, I would drink whatever but um just to enjoy myself I would drink beer so of course when we went out to party you know I would drink hard liquor but if I was just going to stay at home, it would mostly be just beer and wine. I, I drank a lot of wine. So cheap and hit hard and wasn't tastes a lot better than the whiskey to me. Yeah, I used to drink um, whiskey and bourbon. But what I would do is I, I just would take straight shots. I wouldn't even they wouldn't even be cool. They'd be warm shots. And um, I would just do it where. I held my breath, did the shot, and I kind of didn't taste it. And sometimes I'd have a chaser, but if you hold your breath while taking a shot, you don't taste it as much. It's a very minimal taste. Um, that was the trick to me. But, yeah, back to you. You were saying also you met a girl. Yeah, so I got involved with a girl, and uh, it wasn't too long into our involvement that she got pregnant. Oh, boy. <clears throat> yeah. And so now I've got a daughter who is 21 now. Oh. And uh, 
that is uh, that came out of that relationship. But we got together real quick, and she uh, she was not a partier. So she didn't like that lifestyle. Um, but got pregnant and got out of that situation, and um, so then I just partied even harder. You know, now I had this kid on the way and uh, she had left and um, yeah, it just just continued to spiral out of control. So having a daughter didn't help in any way, shape or form to kind of hold you back from your addictive behaviors? No, no, it did not. Nope. Um yeah, from that point on, I mean, it, it got worse, you know, because when they're when she was younger, I uh, I really just had her every other weekend, you know. So, I mean, I was free to do whatever all the rest of the time. And uh, yeah, and that's what I did. I just. Um, just went back to the party and um, got involved in the, in cocaine and. uh pills and uh i pretty much started my i had a really bad addiction to opiates and um it kind of started you know i had always done them on a frequent basis but at that point in my life it started becoming everyday everyday thing drinking and, and doing pills what kind of pills were you popping uh, man, I don't know if, if <clears throat> there's a lot of these altrums around at the time. What are those? Which, man, they, they said they were non-narcotic is what I was always told, but it seemed like doctors would just hand them out like candy, you know, and, and everybody I knew had all these altrums and, uh, but they would kind of speed me up too, you know? Um, did and so you, I, like, did you get euphoria or anything like that? Was it a good feeling? Yeah, no, it gave you a good feeling. You know, it it, uh, it was definitely like an opiate buzz. And really? um, yeah, oh yeah. And uh, I forget the other name for them. Tramadol, maybe. Tramadol? I've, yeah. heard, of tra I've heard of tramadol. Yeah. Um, I'm not familiar with what like it actually is, though. I'm not going to try and be a scientist. Or for our farm pharmacist, I should say. But um all right. I got into everything, you know. Uh back then it seemed like you could get Vicodins and hydrocodone and um uh, morphine. I could get morphine quite a bit. Um yeah, there was just a lot of pills around, it seemed like uh, in the early two thousands. Oh, there were. The doctors were handing out pills like candy because this is way before the opioid opioid epidemic, and also before people started, you know, this, well, I guess it has to do with the opioid uh, epidemic, the pill mills and stuff like that. Yeah, pill mills were pumping those things out like oh, candy. Yeah. There are places where you didn't even see the doctor. You saw the doctor once, and then from that on point on. You just went to the office. They gave you, they literally at the office. I don't, I forgot how they did it, but they were, I think they actually gave it to you right there. And you can get one every month for like 180 pills, something like that. But a lot of those doctors obviously got arrested and stuff like that, got prosecuted, and they deserved it. They were, uh, they were drug dealers. Yeah. Of some no, heavy I shit. What's that? I said they were drug dealers of some heavy shit. You know, to me, that's a that's a big deal giving out painkillers because you're turning so many people because of that into heroin addicts. And if not, people are still overdosing on just taking pills as well. Oh, yeah. So it's a very dangerous drug. I yeah. used to love them. Yeah, I did too, man. And that. I went on for years, years and years. So, yeah, I was on pills for a living. I'm trying to remember. Or, I mean, I 
taken pills for a while, but as far as opioids, it was maybe five years, six years. The only reason I ever stopped was my friend at the time, who was my only connection for it, me and him got into a fight and he stopped helping me get it. And I had no one to ask. So I had to go through withdrawal and all that. And after that, I just got more into alcohol. Yeah. So once you're out of college, what do you do with your life? And I wasn't, uh, I wasn't doing a lot for about three years. It seemed like I, uh, I really just partied real hard. Um, and had, uh, I don't know, there was just always a party at my house, you know, it seemed like for about three years straight. And, um, is that your parents' house? No, no, at the time. So let's see, when I graduated, I graduated in 98 and I had moved out before I graduated, but, um, where'd you go? Where'd you move to? I moved in with a friend of mine and um, I lived with him for a few months and then I, How I old was uh, he? he was a year older than me. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Still so young. Yeah. And he, he was doing all the same stuff I was doing, you know, and it was a, it was a big party house and um, I lived there for a couple months and that's when, you know, I started school. And I had met another girl that she didn't party. And so that's when I did start doing well for about two years. You know, I did okay. But uh, <clears throat> me and her were together. I don't know. It wasn't all that long, maybe a year or so. And then, um, of course, I met that other girl. And, and uh, you know, at the end of uh, that two years of school, where I was starting to party a little bit more. And then, um, but I had my own place at that time. I lived in a, a trailer park out in the country. So <laughs> it was like the wild west out there, man. It was yeah. uh, the guy that owned it was a complete redneck. I mean, he was a big drunk, you know, and uh, man, he, I was really wild, but like the owner was the wildest person there. So you could just kind of, it's just a free for all, man. I mean, it, it was loud. It, the whole, whole community seemed like we were all partying you know um yeah. but you're out in the middle of nowhere and so nobody cared and um but anyhow so that's what i did for about three years and um partied with a bunch of people were you working at the time to make some money to pay for your bills you know i always worked but i never worked steady you know um what kind of jobs would you get? I worked at a foundry for a while. I worked uh, delivering pizzas, I, mostly factories and stuff like that. I'd, I'd jump around to factories mostly. You know, I worked in hotels at the time. Um, yeah, just small stuff like that, you know. I made Whatever you can get, it sounds like. Yeah. And I just, back then I just, I didn't really have many bills. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I lived in a trailer and, uh, I, I didn't need much to pay the bills. It was just me. You know, I paid, I did always pay my child support. I, uh, I didn't need much to feed me and take care of me. You know, I always had a car, um, things always got paid and I always had enough to party on and that's really all I cared about, you know? So, but, so, um, so you said you partied straight for about three years after college. Yeah. What happened in that third year that you ended up stopping everything? So <clears throat> I, let's see, that was about 2005, I guess. I, uh, I got a job at an answering service, which you wouldn't think was much, but they actually paid really decent at the time. And um, that's, and I became a supervisor. And 
I could almost get unlimited hours at this job, you know, and I really enjoyed it. And what I would do, this, this really fed my pill addiction, but I found that, um, you know, I could work long shifts and I could just talk on the phone really well after I ate pills, you know? And so it really fed my addiction. I mean, I was working 60, 70 hours a week and, uh, sometimes even more than that, you know, I mean, making, it wasn't great money, but, um, it was, it was all right. It was like 13 bucks an hour, you know, is what I was making then. But, uh, in 2005 and, and getting all the overtime. And like I said, it was just me. And so that really fed my addiction too, you know, and then it started to be, I, I do remember the first time I realized that I was addicted is because I started to go to work early in the morning, probably five or six in the morning. And I didn't have any pills. And, and I remember smoking a joint on the way there and uh, just having cold sweats thinking about it. And, and so, you know, I had to uh, call somebody and uh, have them meet me there with some pills on lunch break, you know, but that was the first time where I had an idea that, man, um, I, I have to have these now. And what was going through your brain when your brain told you what, what, what else was going through your brain when it told you you needed to keep on to those? You know, I, keep I taking those. I didn't I didn't like it because you said you realized you needed it. Yeah, but man, in the throes of addiction and, you know, I was only 25 years old. Um, in a weird way, I just didn't care. So instead of thinking like, well, maybe I should take care of this problem. My thought process is like, I got to make sure I have pills before I go to bed. Like, why are you, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, don't, don't don't do that again so um yeah that was my solution is like just dude make sure you have pills before you go to work and so uh so that's what i did yeah it really stays be like like you said being in the throes of addiction we just do what we can just to get the drugs it doesn't matter um so you said you realized wow, I need these, I'm addicted. What did you do next? Once you realized, well, I mean, let me ask you, did you realize at that point you had an addiction problem? I didn't see it as a problem. You know, I, uh, like I said, in my warped mind and my warped sick thinking at the time, the solution was to make sure I have pills when I wake up in the morning, you know, that seemed like the easiest thing to do because I didn't want to quit. And I liked the feeling and, uh, I didn't feel bad if I was using. So the solution was not to quit at that time. The solution was like, make sure I have those pills on hand. So. So at what point did you actually say to yourself, I need recovery? I, I can't handle this no more. I, you know, my shit's falling apart. My life is unmanageable. At what point did you need to say to yourself, I need to get sober? Well, that was 2005. It was probably about 2011 or 12. Okay. And how did it happen? Man, my life had spiraled completely out of control. And it's the, the crazy part about this is that it took so much for me to be like, maybe I should quit, you know, because that was never the answer. The answer was always do something else different, do something else different. And these, uh, you know, it's, it's the insanity part of it. But I thought if I, if I just changed certain things, maybe I would change. Okay. You know what? I'm not going to, to drink a pitcher of margaritas at the Mexican restaurant, you know, um, 
when I take these pills, you know, or um, I'm not going to, I'm only going to drink beer, you know, because if the, that wine and the whiskey and stuff really mixes bad with the pills, you know, or I'm never going to take, you know, the, uh, oh, I forget what they're called. They're not, uh, I call them forget me nots. They're not Valiums, but, uh, like when I was in jail, everybody that was in jail for stealing seemed Glodipin? like they would. Yeah, yeah, Glodipin. I used to take those. I used to get prescribed those. Dude, I'd take them and forget everything. <laughs> me, me too, yeah. Especially if you mix them with alcohol. That was my thing. I used to mix them with alcohol all the time, and that's really dangerous. Oh, yeah. I'd wake up. I remember one time I woke up and my pockets were full of beef jerky. And uh, I went to the <laughs> The VP is what somebody told me. I went down to the VP and they're like, dude, like you were stuffing your pockets full of beef jerky. Like, dude, that's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so dumb. Um, so that was my solution, you know, was just to try different stuff. But I do remember. I do remember thinking in two, like I would at this point in 2011. I would physically get sick like <clears throat> like really sick you know very sick with all the stomach issues the cold sweats couldn't hardly move I mean it wasn't just that I needed them it's like I was dope sick and uh I remember the first time I thought you know what like I'm starting to get to where I do need to quit and so I remember intentionally not having pills um when i woke up and it was terrible and it was terrible and um then i knew i knew for sure it was a very bad deal and i couldn't stop but i didn't want to feel that pain so i continued to do these things and uh in my mind i just it was hopeless thinking man this is just how it's going to be forever, you know? And, uh, and I started to hate it. But unfortunately you still did it. I still did it. Yes, I did. Yep. And, um, I actually, I got arrested <clears throat> And, and I was getting arrested every once in a while, but man, it was just like a night or two in jail. And so I never really faced any consequences, you know, but uh, I remember I got arrested and I was in jail for a month and a half. And uh, my lawyer just said, dude, I can't get you out anymore. Like you can't, I, you know, I had gotten out on bail. I had gotten out on pre uh, trial detention and uh, everything just kept getting revoked. And he's like, I can't get you out anymore. And so I had to go through the withdrawals there in jail. And it was just terrible for about three days. Do they do anything to help you medically? No, no, they did not, man. Um, and I had requested, you know, the, well, whatever pill concoction it is to, that they give you, I forget what it's called, but I put in a request for that. Well, it was like on the weekend. And by the time they looked at it, they said that, you know, my withdrawal should be over soon. So, so basically I didn't, I didn't get anything, but it was terrible for about three days, but man, you know, afterwards, I started to feel a lot better. And, uh, yeah, then my dude, I felt a lot better, you know. And, and, and as weeks went on, my mind started to get better too. Like, I could feel a fog lifting off of me, you know. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a great feeling, dude. It was. And, um, yeah, so that was 2000. And, it was actually 2013 let's see 2012 i think 
when that happened. And what did you do to start your recovery? Well, it wasn't at that point because once I got out, I went back to using again. Um, oh, I boy. stayed, yeah, I stayed clean until I got, um, I stayed clean until I got off probation. And uh, I was all about sobriety at first. But then uh, after about nine months of it, I was ready to party again, man. Like, it's like the trouble seemed to be going away and uh, the charges were dropping off. And then it was just misdemeanor probation. And um, I wasn't, I wasn't wanting to be sober. You know, I thought sobriety sucks. And uh, I thought this time, this time though, I'm going to be able to handle it. You know, I'm going to be able to do it right. And um, I, I got back on the pills real bad at this time. A friend of mine had access to, uh, oh, it was uh, uh, Oxy, uh, Oxycontin. So I was taking about, there at the end, man, I was taking about 320 milligrams of Oxycontin a day. Wow. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. Well, he got them real cheap. And so I started, I started dealing them. I started getting them off him and then selling them. And uh, I don't even know where he got them from, but I know it wasn't good how he got these. But, um, but he got them cheap and I was selling them. And then it wasn't long before I thought, man, I'm going to take half of one, you know, um, they were, uh, they were 80 milligrams is what they were. And so started out taking half and it wasn't long, man, before I needed that whole one. And then it was two a day and then it was three a day and then it was four a day. And then I remember him saying, uh, yeah, dude, I'm out. Like I'm out. He had like access to like 900 of them when we started and we went through all these and, uh, dude, it about killed me coming yeah. off. But, uh, but I still kept on with the drinking. And, uh, once I got through that withdrawal, I didn't do the pills too much. I was still doing them. I had access to morphine at that time and, uh, I was doing it a few times a week, but not every day. And, uh, what's the morphine I, a pill as well? Yeah. Yeah, it was. And I would get liquid methadone every once in a while from people. Uh, about once a week, I thought I'm going to treat myself, you know, and, um, and Why I would method do methadone would get you high. The liquid methadone. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty high, man. Yeah. I've never heard that. I don't know. Oh, it's terrible. Well, you know, these people go down to these methadone clinics, man. And, uh, they come back with all this methadone and once first you you got to take your dosage there and then once you like earn once you've been going so long you can prove that you're taking it like you're supposed to then you go every other day and then eventually you go once a week so you come home with a week's worth of stuff well a lot of these people that i knew were selling it and then buying heroin so oh my God. yeah so i would do the methadone and um but I, uh, I got with a girl in 2013 and me and her partied pretty hard. And I would say in about 2016, we started smoking crack and dude, I gave everything away for crack. And, uh, within a year, I had a house at the time. It was actually an apartment building that I had bought um, in 2005. And I, I lived in one and I rented the other two out um, while I was working for that answering service. And I had I had kept that property for, you know, 12 years, I guess. And uh, but we started smoking crack. And within a year, man, I. Uh, oh, and in 2015, 
sorry, I'm skipping over this. In 2015, me and this girl had had a, a son. So okay. she got pregnant. She moved in with me. Um, we had a son. He's seven years old now. And in 2017, we had another son. But uh, by that time, you know, we had been addicted to crack for about a year. And I uh, lost my house. You know, we lost our cars. Um, and we actually lost our kids. Uh, she, the uh, CPS had been called on us a bunch. And we continued to refuse to cooperate with them. We didn't let them in. And I knew we were on the radar. And so when she was at the hospital, we had, it wasn't an open case, but somebody had called recently. And so they've got like a 30 days where they can open an investigation. And even though it's not a case, we were still on the radar. And uh, her doctor had actually reported that she had a positive drug screen. My, she was my girlfriend then. She's my wife now. But uh, my girlfriend had a positive drug screen and they contacted DCS. DCS came to the hospital and did a uh, test on the umbilical cord and found uh, crack cocaine and uh, oh, some, some sort of uh, opiate in the umbilical cord. Now, the baby did not test positive for drugs himself, but it was still in the umbilical cord, and it was enough for them to, to take our kids from us. How long was it before you got them back? They were in the system for 10 months. Okay. I mean, that's a long time for them, but it's not, it's not a crazy long time. No, no. Must have felt like forever to you. It did. And the thing is, you know, when you, you're at that level, you're at your lowest point and then take your kids away. And then you, you go even lower, you know, I mean, the depression, I can't even describe the depression. And not only that, I don't have anything holding me back at that point. There's nothing holding me back from doing whatever I wanted to do. And um, we continue to smoke crack, you know, and drink. And uh, it got worse. And worse. So let's talk about your recovery. So what happened was we, uh, September 6th, let's see, September 15th of 2017, I was drinking and driving and um, my wife was in the car. Our kids are not, not in our care. We're living in a motel. We got a few boxes of items and uh, we're in uh, on a country road. I'm going really fast. I'm going, uh, they said, probably about over 70 miles an hour. And I flipped, I flipped this car. So it was the second time I've done this in my life. But uh, you flipped two cars. Yeah, that first one was in high school. You know, that uh, I had mentioned earlier when I was drinking, I flipped a car in high school. Yeah. But I flipped this car. I I remember it being in the air. I remember being upside down, man. It was like slow motion, you know. Yeah. And, uh, dude, all the windows busted out except for my wife's. So we, like I said, we weren't married yet. Um, the The car was completely demolished. And when I got out, <clears throat> there was blood all the way down the side of this car. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like something bad has happened. And I'm OK. And my girlfriend gets out. And she's OK. And I don't know what that was, man. It had to be some sort of animal that we hit 
in the field. It was, it was in the country. We rolled into a field. Um, I hit a culvert, which is what caused the flip. And, uh, anyways, I got arrested. It was my third DUI. And, uh, I was sitting in jail and man, I just, I was at my lowest point. I couldn't go any lower, but I knew, I knew, and I felt that God saved me from that wreck. You know, I just walked away and I shouldn't have walked away, man. My wife walked away and she should not have walked away. And I knew that God had saved me. And, uh, and I just cried out to him, Lord, you know, please help me, help me. And I felt this peace come on me. You know, I felt this peace come on me. And I made up my mind that I was not going to do drugs or alcohol anymore. And the next day, my wife bailed me out. This was September 17th, I guess. September 16th is when I, I got saved and gave my life to Christ. And I remember waiting for her to come pick me up and thinking, I got to tell her, like, I'm not doing drugs, like I'm not doing it. And uh, I got in the car and we talked for a second. And I said, look, I, uh, I'm not going to do drugs anymore. And I don't want to do drugs anymore. And uh, I told her that I got saved. And uh, she said she didn't want to do drugs anymore either. And she got saved that day, too. And, uh, you know, I know it doesn't work like this for everybody, but God took those desires away from me, man. He took that away from me. And uh, after smoking crack for a year and doing drinking for, you know, 20 some years and all the other stuff, I just didn't have a desire to do it anymore, man. And uh, there was a program called the RU Recovery Program, and they had come into the jail years earlier. And I remembered them. And I had went a couple times in the last year. Like, we went three to three different meetings throughout the last year. And I said, let's, let's call those people. And so that was on a Sunday. And uh, a couple came and picked us up and took us to church. And... Uh, We've been going to church and the RU recovery um, ever since then. That's great. So it's always good to find a program, and I'm glad that you found one. Um, so RU recovery, do they have like their own steps or anything like that they do to help in your journey of sobriety? It, they do. So um, we don't have steps. We have... Uh, what they call the 10 principles of oh, okay. RU, which is, uh, it is, um, biblical, biblically based principles and, and they each have, uh, a verse to them, but there's 10 of them. And let me see. I thought I had them right here, but like, um, the first is, if God's against it, so am I. And then uh, let's see if I can remember. The second is, um, let's see, every sin has its origin in our hearts. And the third is, uh, it's easier to keep the heart clean than to clean it after it's been defiled. And four is we cannot fight a uh, fleshly temptation with fleshly weapons. Five is uh, small compromises lead to big disasters. Six is those who don't love the Lord will not help us serve the Lord. Seven is our sinful habits do hurt those that follow us. Eight is we cannot fight a fleshly appetite by indulging in it. Nine is our consequences are inevitable, incalculable, and up to God. Uh, we lose the freedom to choose when we give in to temptation. And ten is... God balances guilt with blame. Accept the blame for your actions and God will remove the guilt. 
So those are the 10 principles that we go by. And, um, and you memorize those and it's a discipleship class. So you have challenges that you do. And sometimes the challenge is service work or going to a church service or uh, doing an essay or doing a testimony or reading certain verses, memorizing verses. But those 10 principles helped me. You know, I had been through AA and NA and I felt and while they're they're great, man, and, and I know a lot of people, um, you know, because I'm part of the recovery scene here in my town. And so we work with a, a lot of those people in those groups uh, right alongside beside them, because, um, you know, what works for for one person may not work with somebody else. And one thing that I really enjoy right now, man, what I like seeing is so many a variety of successful programs so that um, people people have different choices and and they're able to go see what works for them but um, you know I I was getting hung up on uh, on uh, just I would I would fail a lot man and I'd always have to go back into those rooms and 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 tell everybody and uh but and, and it got me discouraged man but these principles i just started to memorize them okay if god's against this so am i you know that's just basic don't do that don't do that and uh it's easier to keep the heart clean than to clean it after it's been defiled well i knew that's tried and true i knew that in my life you know it is way easier to not do the drug than to try to get recovered after you started again, you know. It sounds like um, the steps that helped you. It, it really helped me. Well, and so it, the principles, I apologize. Oh, hey, it's they, they really did help me, you know, and they still help me when stuff comes into my mind. Uh, it helps me to make decisions. And... Um, but yeah, so that's that's what I did, man. And I just went to uh, safe places, you know. We went to church all the time. We went to the RU program, and uh, I didn't associate with. I, I did all the things that I should have. I did all the things that somebody is serious in recovery did. You know, I did change the people in the playgrounds. You know, I changed the playmates, the playgrounds, and. Um, yeah, I just made a determination like I am not going to go to these places. I am not going to talk to those people. And my first, you know, one thing that scared me was uh, not having friends. And it's crazy now, but I know we all feel that when we go like, man, what would I do if I'm sober? Like, what do you do? Who yeah. do you hang? And uh, but then you find out, man, these people aren't your friends. You know, most of these people are not your friends. And uh, I'm not saying everybody I hung out with was bad people because there's a lot of good people. But we don't really talk anymore, you know. Um, yeah. so. so getting towards the end here, let me ask you one last question. Do you have any advice for people watching and listening? Man, I would say uh, if you, number one, don't do drugs and alcohol. <laughs> yeah, that is not the, uh, that is not the thing to do. Um, but I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people watching this are, are uh, in recovery or thinking about recovery. And I would just say that, uh, man, your story, whatever it is, whatever your path is, get that story out there, man. Get your victory out there. Tell how you got clean. Uh, let the world hear about it, man, because you don't know who out there might be inspired and motivated to, uh, to get clean and sober because of your story. And, um, I would just say that, uh, 
we got to love each other. You know, we got to, uh, we got to love each other enough to reach out to, to those that are still suffering and, uh, and tell our story and uh, to offer to be there for those people too. So I think a lot of it, when I got into this program at RU is I really felt <clears throat> the love of the, the group and they become like a family to me. And uh, that helped me when I was concerned about not having people in my life anymore. And so that helped me transition. So be loving to that one that comes in the doors, man, whatever your program is, uh, love them, give them a smile, let them know you're there and uh, let them know you believe in them. Awesome, man. Awesome. I think this has been an awesome interview. How do you feel, my friend? <laughs> I feel good. I feel good, man. And I feel uh, I feel blessed to be here and to be able to share my testimony. And I thank you for doing this for people and uh, just getting the hope out there, man. Every story, every victory is important, man. And it's important to for others to hear. Yeah, I know. I mean... I have a lot of people that have reached out and said to me, you know, I related to the story, you know, et cetera. So we've had people that, you know, we know it reaches out. Yeah. So do you have anything else you want to add? Um, man, I, uh, I would just add if you, uh, you know, if, if you haven't tried, are you, if, uh, you've been, uh, to other places and you um you're still suffering i would encourage you to look up an ru meeting it's called ru recovery they're all uh, it's actually an international but they're all across our country you can get onto the ru recovery.com and uh, look up a, a um, look up a meeting and uh or you can get on there and just look at the principles and some of the literature. Um, so. Awesome, man. Awesome. Really appreciate it. So I wanted to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, my friend. It's really much appreciated. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And it was very nice to meet you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. So sit tight for me. And for people watching and listening, if you like what you saw and heard, go below and give us a like. Also, subscribe to see when we upload new videos. We're on all social media platforms like Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. You should also check out our website, which is www.addicts-anonymous.com. There you will find plenty of resources as well as free literature. That's all we have for today. I hope you enjoyed. And until next time.